Chapter thirty seven, part three of the Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, volume three. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kirsten Ferreri. The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire by Edward Gibbon, volume three, chapter thirty seven. Conversion of the Barbarians to Christianity, part three. The different motives which influence the reason or the passions of the barbarian converts cannot easily be ascertained. They were often capricious and accidental. A dream, an omen, the report of a miracle, the example of some priest or hero, the charms of a believing wife, and, above all, the fortunate event of a prayer or vow which, in a moment of danger, they had addressed to the God of the Christians. The early prejudices of education were insensibly erased by the habits of frequent and familiar society. The moral precepts of the Gospels were protected by the extravagant virtues of the monks, and a spirit of theology was supported by the visible power of relics, and the pomp of religious worship. But the rational and ingenious mode of persuasion, which a Saxon bishop suggested to a popular saint, might sometimes be employed by the missionaries, who laboured for the conversion of infidels. Admit, says the sagacious disputant, whatever they are pleased to assert of the fabulous and carnal genealogy of their gods and goddesses who are propagated from each other. From this principle deduce their imperfect nature and human infirmities, the assurance that they were born, and the probability that they will die. At what time, by what means, from what cause, were the eldest of the gods or goddesses produced? Do they still continue, or have they ceased to propagate? If they have ceased, summon your antagonists to declare the reason of this strange alteration. If they still continue, the number of gods must become infinite, and shall we not risk, by the indiscreet worship of some impotent deity, to excite the resentment of his jealous superior? The visible heavens and earth, the whole system of the universe which may be conceived by the mind, is it created or eternal? If created, how or where could the gods themselves exist before creation? If eternal, how could they assume the empire of an independent and pre-existing world? Urge these arguments with temper and moderation. Insinuate at seasonable intervals the truth and beauty of the Christian revelation, and endeavor to make the unbelievers ashamed without making them angry. This metaphysical reasoning, too refined, perhaps, for the barbarians of Germany, was fortified by the grosser weight of authority and popular consent. The advantage of temporal prosperity had deserted the pagan cause, and passed over to the service of Christianity. The Romans themselves, the most powerful and enlightened nation of the globe, had renounced their ancient superstition, and if the ruin of their empire seemed to accuse the efficacy of the new faith, the disgrace was already retrieved by the conversion of the victorious Goths. The valiant and fortunate barbarians, who subdued the provinces of the West, successfully received and reflected the same edifying example. Before the age of Charlemagne, the Christian nations of Europe might exult in the exclusive possession of the temperate climates, of the fertile lands, which produced corn, wine, and oil, while the savage idolaters, and their helpless idols, were confined to the extremities of the earth, the dark and frozen regions of the north. Christianity, which opened the gates of heaven to the barbarians, introduced an important change in their moral and political condition. They received at the same time the use of letters, so essential to a religion whose doctrines are contained in a sacred book, and while they studied the divine truth, their minds were insensibly enlarged by the distant view of history, of nature, of the arts, and of society. The version of the scriptures into their native tongue, which had facilitated their conversion, must excite among their clergy some curiosity to read the original text, to understand the sacred liturgy of the church, and to examine in the ranks of the fathers the chain of ecclesiastical tradition. These spiritual gifts were preserved in the Greek and Latin languages, which concealed the inestimable monuments of ancient learning. The immortal productions of Virgil, Cicero, and Livy, which were accessible to the Christian barbarians, maintained a silent intercourse between the reign of Augustus and the times of Clovis and Charlemagne. The emulation of mankind was encouraged by the remembrance of a more perfect state, and the flame of science was scarcely kept alive to warm and enlighten the mature age of the Western world. In the most corrupt state of Christianity, the barbarians might learn justice from the law, and mercy from the gospel, and if the knowledge of their duty was insufficient to guide their actions, or to regulate their passions, they were sometimes restrained by conscience, and frequently punished by remorse. But the direct authority of religion was less effectual than the Holy Communion, which united them with their Christian brethren in spirit friendship. The influence of these sentiments contributed to secure their fidelity in the servants or the alliance of the Romans to alleviate the horrors of the war. 
to moderate the insolence of conquest, and to preserve in the downfall of the empire a permanent respect for the name and institutions of Rome. In the days of paganism, the priests of Gaul and Germany reigned over the people, and controlled the jurisdiction of the magistrates, and the zealous proselytes transferred to an equal or more ample measure of devout obedience to the pontiffs of the Christian faith. The sacred character of the bishops was supported by their temporal possessions. They obtained an honorable seat in the legislative assemblies of soldiers and freemen, and it was their interest, as well as their duty, to mollify by peaceful counsels the fierce spirit of the barbarians." the perpetual correspondence of the Latin clergy, the frequent pilgrimages to Rome and Jerusalem, and the growing authority of the popes, cemented the union of the Christian Republic, and gradually produced the similar manners and common jurisprudence which have distinguished from the rest of mankind the independent and even hostile nations of modern Europe. But the operation of these causes was checked and retarded by the unfortunate accident which infused a deadly poison into the cup of salvation. Whatever might be the early sentiments of Ulphilus, his connections with the empire and the church were formed during the reign of Arianism. The apostle of the Goths subscribed the creed of Rimini, professed with freedom and perhaps with sincerity that the Son was not equal or consubstantial to the Father, communicated these errors to the clergy and the people, and infected the barbaric world with a heresy which the Theodosius prescribed and extinguished among the Romans. The temper and understanding of the new proselytes were not adapted to metaphysical subtleties, but they strenuously maintained what they had piously received, as the pure and genuine doctrines of Christianity. The advantage of preaching and expounding the scriptures in the Teutonic language promoted the apostolic labors of Ulphilus and his successors, and they ordained a competent number of bishops and presbyters for the instruction of the kindred tribes the Ostrogoths, the Burgundians, the Suevi, and the Vandals, who had listened to the eloquence of the Latin clergy, preferred the more intelligible lessons of their domestic teachers. And Arianism was adopted as the national faith of the warlike converts, who were seated on the ruins of the Western Empire. This irreconcilable difference of religion was a perpetual source of jealousy and hatred, and the reproach of barbarian was embittered by the more odious epithet of heretic. The heroes of the North, who had submitted with some reluctance to believe that all their ancestors were in hell, were astonished and exasperated to learn that they themselves had only changed the mode of their internal condemnation. Instead of the smooth applause which Christian kings are accustomed to expect from their royal prelates, the Orthodox bishops and their clergy were in a state of opposition to the Arian courts, and their indiscreet opposition frequently became criminal, and sometimes might be dangerous." The pulpit, that safe and sacred organ of sedition, resounded with the names of Pharaoh and Holofernes. The public discontent was inflamed by the hope or promise of glorious deliverance, and the seditious saints were tempted to promote the accomplishment of their own predictions. Notwithstanding these provocations, the Catholics of Gaul, Spain, and Italy enjoyed, under the reign of the Arians, the free and peaceful exercise of their religion. Their haughty masters respected the zeal of a numerous people, resolved to die at the foot of their altars, and the example of their devout constancy was admired and imitated by the barbarians themselves. The conquerors evaded, however, the disgraceful reproach or confession of fear by attributing their toleration to the liberal motives of reason and humanity, and while they affected the language, they imperceptibly imbibed the spirit of genuine Christianity. The peace of the Church was sometimes interrupted. The Catholics were indiscreet, the barbarians were impatient, and the partial acts of severity or injustice which had been recommended by the Arian clergy were exaggerated by the orthodox writers. The guilt of persecution may be imputed to Yorick, king of the Visigoths, who suspended the exercise of the ecclesiastical, or at least of episcopal, functions, and punished the popular bishops of Aquitaine with imprisonment, exile, and confiscation. But the cruel and absurd enterprise of subduing the minds of a whole people was undertaken by the Vandals alone. Genseric himself, in his early youth, had renounced the Orthodox communion, and the apostate could neither grant nor expect a sincere forgiveness. He was exasperated to find that the Africans, who had fled before him in the field, still presumed to dispute his will in synods and churches, and his ferocious mind was incapable of fear or of compassion. His Catholic subjects were oppressed by intolerant laws and arbitrary punishments. The language of Genseric was furious and formidable. The knowledge of his intentions might justify the most unfavorable interpretation of his actions, and the Arians were reproached with the frequent executions which stained the palace and the dominions of the tyrant. Arms and ambition were, however, the ruling passions of the mark of the sea. 
but Huneric, his inglorious son, who seemed to inherit only his vices, fell to the Catholics with the same unrelenting fury which had been fatal to his brother, his nephews, and the friends and favourites of his father, and even to the Arian patriarch, who was inhumanly burnt alive in the midst of Carthage. The religious war was preceded and prepared by an insidious truce. Persecution was made the serious and important business of Vandal Court, and a loathsome disease which had hastened the death of Huneric revenged the injuries without contributing to the deliverance of the Church. The throne of Africa was successively filled by the two nephews of Huneric, by Gundamund, who reigned about twelve, and by Thrasimund, who governed the nation about twenty-seven years. Their administration was hostile and oppressive to the Orthodox party. Gundamund appeared to emulate or even to surpass the cruelty of his uncle, and if at length he relented, if he recalled the bishops, and restored the freedom of Athanasian worship, a premature death intercepted the benefits of his tardy clemency. His brother, Thrasimund, was the greatest and most accomplished of the Vandal kings, whom he excelled in beauty, prudence, and magnanimity of soul. But this magnanimous character was degraded by his intolerant zeal and deceitful clemency. Instead of threats and tortures, he employed the gentle but efficacious powers of seduction. Wealth, dignity, and the royal favour were the liberal rewards of apostasy. The Catholics, who had violated the laws, might purchase their pardon by the renunciation of their faith, and whenever Thrasimund meditated any rigorous measure, he patiently waited till the indiscretion of his adversaries furnished him with a specious opportunity. Bigotry was his last sentiment in the hour of death, and he exacted from his successor a solemn oath that he would never tolerate the sectaries of Athanasius. But his successor, Hilderic, the gentle son of the savage Huneric, preferred the duties of humanity and justice to the vain obligation of an impious oath, and his accession was gloriously marked by the restoration of peace and universal freedom. The throne of that virtuous though feeble monarch was usurped by his cousin Gelimer, a zealous Arian. But the Vandal kingdom, before he could enjoy or abuse his power, was subverted by the arms of Belisarius, and the Orthodox party retaliated the injuries which they had endured. The passionate declamations of the Catholics, the sole historians of this persecution, cannot afford any distinct series of causes and events, any impartial view of the characters or counsels, but the most remarkable circumstances that deserve either credit or notice may be referred to the following heads. 1. In the original law, which is still extant, Huneric expressly declares, and the declaration appears to be correct, that he had faithfully transcribed the regulations and penalties of the imperial edicts against the heretical congregations, the clergy, and the people, who dissented from the established religion. If the rights of conscience had been understood, the Catholics must have condemned their past conduct, or acquiesced in their actual suffering but they still persisted to refuse the indulgence which they claimed. While they trembled under the lash of persecution, they praised the laudable severity of Huneric himself, who burnt or banished great numbers of Manichaeans, and they rejected with horror the ignominious compromise that the disciples of Arius and of Athanasius should enjoy a reciprocal and similar toleration in the territories of the Romans, and in those of the Vandals. 2. The practice of a conference, which the Catholics had so frequently used to insult and punish their obstinate antagonists, was retorted against themselves. At the command of Huneric, four hundred and sixty-six Orthodox bishops assembled at Carthage, but when they were admitted into the hall of audience, they had the mortification of beholding the Arian Cyrilla exalted on the patriarchal throne. The disputants were separated, after the mutual and ordinary reproaches of noise and silence, of delay and precipitation of military force and of popular clamour. One martyr and one confessor were selected on the Catholic bishops. Twenty-eight escaped by flight, and eighty-eight by conformity. Forty-six were sent into Corsica to cut timber for the royal navy, and three hundred and two were banished to the different parts of Africa, exposed to the insults of their enemies, and carefully deprived of all temporal and spiritual comforts of life. The hardship of ten years' exile must have reduced their numbers, and if they had complied with the law of Thrasimund, which prohibited any episcopal consecrations, the Orthodox Church of Africa must have expired with the lives of its actual members. They disobeyed, and their disobedience was punished by a second exile of two hundred and twenty bishops into Sardinia, where they languished fifteen years, till the accession of the gracious Hilderic. The two islands were judiciously chosen by the malice of their Arian tyrants. Seneca, from his own experience, 
has deplored and exaggerated the miserable state of Corsica, and the plenty of Sardinia was overbalanced by the unwholesome quality of the air. 3. The zeal of Generic and his successors for the conversion of the Catholics must have rendered them still more jealous to guard the purity of the Vandal faith. Before the churches were finally shut, it was a crime to appear in barbarian dress, and those who presumed to neglect the royal mandate were rudely dragged backwards by their long hair. The Palatine officers, who refused to profess the religion of their prince, were ignominiously stripped of their honours and employments, banished to Sardinia and Sicily, or condemned to the servile labours of slaves and peasants in the fields of Utica. In the districts which had been particularly allotted to the Vandals, the exercise of the Catholic worship was more strictly prohibited, and severe penalties were denounced against the guilt both of the missionary and the proselyte. By these arts the faith of the barbarians was preserved, and their zeal was inflamed. They discharged with devout fury the office of spies, informers, and executioners, and whenever their cavalry took the field, it was the favorite amusement of the march to defile the churches, and to insult the clergy and the satisfaction. The citizens who had been educated in the luxury of the Roman province were delivered with exquisite cruelty to the moors of the desert. A venerable train of bishops, presbyters, and deacons, with a faithful crowd of four thousand ninety-six persons, whose guilt is not precisely ascertained, were torn from their native homes by the command of Huneric. During the night they were confined like a herd of cattle amidst their own ordure. During the day they pursued their march over the burning sands, and if they fainted under the heat and fatigue, they were goaded or dragged along till they expired in the hands of their tormentors. The unhappy exiles, when they reached the Moorish huts, might excite the compassion of a people whose native humanity was neither improved by reason nor corrupted by fanaticism, but if they escaped the dangers, they were condemned to share the distress of a savage life. 5. It is incumbent on the authors of persecution previously to reflect whether they determined to support it in the last extreme. They excite the flame which they strive to extinguish, and it soon becomes necessary to chastise the contumacy as well as the crime of the offender. The fine which he is unable or unwilling to discharge exposes his person to the severity of the law, and his contempt of lighter penalties suggests the use and propriety of capital punishment. Through veil of fiction and declamation we may clearly perceive that the Catholics, more especially under the reign of Huneric, endured the most cruel and ignominious treatment. Respectable citizens, noble matrons, and consecrated virgins were stripped naked and raised in the air by pulleys, with a weight suspended at their feet. In this painful attitude their naked bodies were torn with scourges, or burnt in the most tender parts with red-hot plates iron. The amputation of the ears, the nose, the tongue, and the right hand was inflicted by the Arians and although the precise number cannot be defined, it is evident that many persons, among whom a bishop and a proconsul may be named, were entitled to the crown of martyrdom. The same honour has been ascribed to the memory of Count Sebastian, who professed the Nicene Creed with unshaken constancy, and Genseric might detest as a heretic the brave and ambitious fugitive whom he dreaded as a rival. 6. A new mode of conversion which might subdue the feeble and alarm the timorous, was employed by the Arian ministers. They imposed, by fraud or violence, the rites of baptism, and punished the apostasy of the Catholics if they disclaimed this odious and profane ceremony, which scandalously violated the freedom of the will and the unity of the sacrament. The hostile sects had formerly allowed the validity of each baptism, and the innovation so fiercely maintained by the Vandals can be imputed only to the example and advice of the Donatists. 7. The Arian clergy surpassed in religious cruelty the king and his vandals, but were incapable of cultivating the spiritual vineyard which they were so desirous to possess. A patriarch might seat himself on the throne of Carthage. Some bishops, in the principal cities, might usurp the place of their rivals. But the smallness of their numbers, and their ignorance of the Latin language, disqualified the barbarians for the ecclesiastical ministry of a great church, and the Africans, after the loss of their orthodox pastors, were deprived of the public exercise of Christianity. 8. The emperors were the natural protectors of the Homosian doctrine, and the faithful people of Africa, both as Romans and as Catholics, preferred their lawful sovereignty to the usurpation of the barbarous heretics. During an interval of peace and friendship, Huneric restored the cathedral of Carthage, at the intercession of Zeno, who reigned in the east, and of Placidia, the daughter and relict of emperors, and the sister of the queen of the Vandals. 
but this decent regard was of short duration, and the haughty tyrant displayed his contempt for the religion of the empire by studiously arranging the bloody images of persecution in all the principal streets through which the Roman ambassador must pass on his way to the palace. An oath was required from the bishops, who were assembled at Carthage, that they would support the succession of his son Hilderic, and that they would renounce all foreign or transmarine correspondence. This engagement, consistent as it should seem with their moral and religious duties, was refused by the more sagacious members of the assembly. Their refusal, faintly colored by the pretense that it is unlawful for a Christian to swear, provoked the suspicions of a jealous tyrant. End of chapter 37, part 37, Part 4 of The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, Volume 3, by Edward Gibbon. Chapter 37 Conversion of the Barbarians to Christianity, Part 4. The Catholics, oppressed by royal and military force, were far superior to their adversaries in numbers and learning. With the same weapons which the Greek and Latin fathers had already provided for the Arian controversy, they repeatedly silenced or vanquished the fierce and illiterate successors of Ophilus. The consciousness of their own superiority might have raised them above the arts and passions of religious warfare. Yet instead of assuming such honorable pride, the orthodox theologians were tempted, by the assurance of impunity, to compose fictions, which must be stigmatized with the epithets of fraud and forgery. They ascribed their own polemical works to the most venerable names of Christian antiquity. The characters of Athanasius and Augustine were awkwardly personated by Vigilus and his disciples, and the famous creed, which so clearly expounds the mysteries of the Trinity and the Incarnation, is deduced, with strong probability, from this African school. Even the scriptures themselves were profaned by their rash and sacrilegious hands. The memorable text, which asserts the unity of the three who bear witness in heaven, is condemned by the universal silence of the Orthodox Fathers, ancient versions, and authentic manuscripts. It was first alleged by the Catholic bishops, whom Hunneric summoned to the Conference of Carthage. An allegorical interpretation, in the form, perhaps, of a marginal note, invaded the text of the Latin Bibles, which were renewed and corrected in a dark period of ten centuries. After the invention of printing, the editors of the Greek Testament yielded to their own prejudices, or those of the times, and the pious fraud, which was embraced with equal zeal at Rome and at Geneva, has been infinitely multiplied in every country and every language of modern Europe. The example of fraud must excite suspicion, and the specious miracles by which the African Catholics have defended the truth and justice of their cause may be ascribed, with more reason, to their own industry than to the visible protection of heaven. Yet the historian, who views this religious conflict with an impartial eye, may condescend to mention one preternatural event, which will edify the devout and surprise the incredulous. Tipasa, a maritime colony of Mauritania, sixteen miles to the east of Caesarea, had been distinguished in every age by the orthodox zeal of its inhabitants. They had braved the fury of the Donatists, they resisted or eluded the tyranny of the Arians. The town was deserted on the approach of an heretical bishop. Most of the inhabitants who could procure ships passed over to the coast of Spain, and the unhappy remnant, refusing all communion with the usurper, still presumed to hold their pious but illegal assemblies. Their disobedience exasperated the cruelty of Hunneric. A military count was dispatched from Carthage to Tipasa. He collected the Catholics in the Forum, and in the presence of the whole province deprived the guilty of their right hands and their tongues. But the holy confessors continued to speak without tongues, and this miracle is attested by Victor, an African bishop, who published a history of the persecution within two years after the event. If any one, says Victor, should doubt of the truth, let him repair to Constantinople, and listen to the clear and perfect language of Restitutus, 
the subdeacon, one of these glorious sufferers, who is now lodged in the palace of the Emperor Zeno, and is respected by the devout empress. At Constantinople we are astonished to find a cool, learned, and unexceptionable witness, without interest and without passion. Aeneas of Gaza, a Platonic philosopher, has accurately described his own observations on these African sufferers. I saw them myself, I heard them speak, I diligently inquired by what means such an articulate voice could be formed without any organ of speech. I used my eyes to examine the report of my ears. I opened their mouth, and saw that the whole tongue had been completely torn away by the roots, an operation which the physicians generally supposed to be mortal. The testimony of Aeneas of Gaza might be confirmed by the superfluous evidence of the Emperor Justinian, in a perpetual edict, of Count Marcellinus, in his Chronicle of the Times, and of Pope Gregory I, who had resided at Constantinople, as the minister of the Roman Pontiff. They all lived within the compass of a century, and they all appealed to their personal knowledge, or the public notoriety, for the truth of a miracle, which was repeated in several instances, displayed on the greatest theatre of the world, and submitted, during a series of years, to the calm examination of the senses. This supernatural gift of the African confessors, who spoke without tongues, will command the assent of those, and of those only, who already believe that their language was pure and orthodox. But the stubborn mind of an infidel is guarded by secret, incurable suspicion, and the Arian, or Socinian, who has seriously rejected the doctrine of a trinity, will not be shaken by the most plausible evidence of an Athanasian miracle. The Vandals and the Ostrogoths persevered in the profession of Arianism till the final ruin of the kingdoms, which they had founded in Africa and Italy. The barbarians of Gaul submitted to the orthodox dominion of the Franks, and Spain was restored to the Catholic Church by the voluntary conversion of the Visigoths. This salutary revolution was hastened by the example of a royal martyr, whom our calmer reason may style an ungrateful rebel. Leovigild, the Gothic monarch of Spain, deserved the respects of his enemies, and the love of his subjects. The Catholics enjoyed a free toleration, and his Arian synods attempted, without much success, to reconcile their scruples by abolishing the unpopular rite of a second baptism. His eldest son, Hermenegild, who was invested by his father with the royal diadem, and the fair principality of Ptica, contracted an honorable and orthodox alliance with the Merovingian princess, the daughter of Sigebert, king of Austrasia and of the famous Brunichild. The beauteous Ingundis, who was no more than thirteen years of age, was received, beloved, and persecuted, in the Arian court of Toledo, and her religious constancy was alternately assaulted, with blandishments and violence, by Geosvintha, the Gothic queen, who abused the double claim of maternal authority. Incensed by her resistance, Geosvintha seized the Catholic princess by her long hair, inhumanly dashed her against the ground, kicked her till she was covered with blood, and at last gave orders that she should be stripped and thrown into a basin or fish-pond. Love and honor might excite Hermenegild to resent this injurious treatment of his bride, and he was gradually persuaded that Ingundis suffered for the cause of divine truth. Her tender complaints, and the weighty arguments of Leander, Archbishop of Seville, accompanied his conversion, and the heir of the Gothic monarchy was initiated in the Nicene faith by the solemn rites of confirmation. The rash youth, inflamed by zeal, and perhaps by ambition, was tempted to violate the duties of a son and a subject, and the Catholics of Spain, although they could not complain of persecution, applauded his pious rebellion against an heretical father. The civil war was protracted by the long and obstinate sieges of Merida, Cordova, and Seville, which had strenuously espoused the party of Hermenegild. He invited the orthodox barbarians, the Suevi, and the Franks, to the destruction of his native land. He solicited the dangerous aid of the Romans, who possessed Africa, and a part of the Spanish coast, and his holy ambassador, the Archbishop Leander, effectually negotiated in person with the Byzantine court. But the hopes of the Catholics were crushed by the active diligence of the monarch, 
who commanded the troops and treasures of Spain, and the guilty Hermenegild, after his vain attempts to resist or escape, was compelled to surrender himself into the hands of an incensed father. Leovigild was still mindful of that sacred character, and the rebel, despoiled of the regal ornaments, was still permitted, in a decent exile, to profess the Catholic religion. His repeated and unsuccessful treasons at length provoked the indignation of the Gothic king, and the sentence of death, which he pronounced with apparent reluctance, was privately executed in the Tower of Seville. The inflexible constancy with which he refused to accept the Arian communion, as the price of his safety, may excuse the honors that had been paid to the memory of St. Hermenegild. His wife and infant son were detained by the Romans in ignominious captivity, and this domestic misfortune tarnished the glories of Leovigild, and embittered the last moments of his life. His son and successor, Recared, the first Catholic king of Spain, had imbibed the faith of his unfortunate brother, which he supported with more prudence and success. Instead of revolting against his father, Recared patiently expected the hour of his death. Instead of condemning his memory, he piously supposed that the dying monarch had abjured the errors of Arianism, and recommended to his son the conversion of the Gothic nation. To accomplish that salutary end, Recared convened an assembly of the Arian clergy and nobles, declared himself a Catholic, and exhorted them to imitate the example of their prince. The laborious interpretation of doubtful texts, or the curious pursuit of metaphysical arguments, would have excited an endless controversy, and the monarch discreetly proposed to his illiterate audience two substantial and visible arguments, the testimony of earth and of heaven. The earth had submitted to the Nicene Synod. The Romans, the barbarians, and the inhabitants of Spain unanimously professed the same orthodox creed, and the Visigoths resisted, almost alone, the consent of the Christian world. A superstitious age was prepared to reverence, as the testimony of heaven, the preternatural cures, which were performed by the skill or virtue of the Catholic clergy, the baptismal fonts of Osset and Batica, which were spontaneously replenished every year, on the vigil of Easter, and the miraculous shrine of St. Martin of Tours, which had already converted the Suevic prince and the people of Galicia. The Catholic king encountered some difficulties on this important change of the national religion. A conspiracy, secretly fomented by the Queen Dowager, was formed against his life, and two counts excited a dangerous revolt in the Narbonese Gaul. But Recared disarmed the conspirators, defeated the rebels, and executed severe justice, which the Arians, in their turn, might brand with the reproach of persecution. Eight bishops, whose names betray their barbaric origin, abjured their errors, and all the books of Arian theology were reduced to ashes, with the house in which they had been purposefully collected. The whole body of the Visigoths and Suevi were allured or driven into the pale of the Catholic communion. The faith, at least of the rising generation, was fervent and sincere, and the devout liberality of the barbarians enriched the churches and monasteries of Spain. Seventy bishops, assembled in the council of Toledo, received the submission of their conquerors, and the zeal of the Spaniards improved the Nicene Creed, by declaring the procession of the Holy Ghost from the Son, as well as from the Father, a weighty point of doctrine, which produced, long afterwards, the schism of the Greek and Latin churches. The royal proselyte immediately saluted and consulted Pope Gregory, surnamed the Great, a learned and holy prelate, whose reign was distinguished by the conversion of heretics and infidels. The ambassadors of Recared respectfully ordered, on the threshold of the Vatican, his rich presents of gold and gems. They accepted, as a lucrative exchange, the hairs of St. John the Baptist, a cross which enclosed a small piece of the true wood, and a key that contained some particles of iron which had been scraped from the chains of St. Peter. The same Gregory, the spiritual conqueror of Britain, encouraged the pious Theodolinda, queen of the Lombards, to propagate the Nicene faith among the victorious savages, whose recent Christianity was polluted by the Arian heresy. Her devout labors still left room for the industry and success of future missionaries, 
and many cities of Italy were still disputed by hostile bishops. But the cause of Arianism was gradually suppressed by the weight of truth, of interest, and of example, and the controversy, which Egypt had derived from the Platonic school, was terminated, after a war of three hundred years, by the final conversion of the Lombards of Italy. The first missionaries who preached the gospel to the barbarians appealed to the evidence of reason, and claimed the benefit of toleration. But no sooner had they established their spiritual dominion than they exhorted the Christian kings to extirpate, without mercy, the remains of Roman or barbaric superstition. The successors of Clovis inflicted one hundred lashes on the peasants, who refused to destroy their idols. The crime of sacrificing to the demons was punished by the Anglo-Saxon laws, with the heavier penalties of imprisonment and confiscation, and even the wise Alfred adopted, as an indispensable duty, the extreme rigor of the Mosaic institutions. But the punishment and the crime were gradually abolished among a Christian people. The theological disputes of the schools were suspended by propitious ignorance, and the intolerant spirit, which could find neither idolaters nor heretics, was reduced to the persecution of the Jews. That exiled nation had founded some synagogues in the cities of Gaul, but Spain, since the time of Hadrian, was filled with their numerous colonies. The wealth which they accumulated by trade, and the management of the finances, invited the pious avarice of their masters, and they might be oppressed without danger, as they had lost the use, and even the remembrance, of arms. Sisabut, a Gothic king, who reigned in the beginning of the seventh century, proceeded at once to the last extremes of persecution. Ninety thousand Jews were compelled to receive the sacrament of baptism. The fortunes of the obstinate infidels were confiscated, their bodies were tortured, and it seems doubtful whether they were permitted to abandon their native country. The excessive zeal of the Catholic king was moderated, even by the clergy of Spain, who solemnly pronounced an inconsistent sentence, that the sacraments should not be forcibly imposed, but that the Jews who had been baptized should be constrained, for the honor of the church, to persevere in the external practice of religion which they disbelieved and detested. Their frequent relapses provoked one of the successors of Sisabut to banish the whole nation from his dominions, and a council of Toledo published a decree that every Gothic king should swear to maintain this salutary edict. But the tyrants were unwilling to dismiss the victims, whom they delighted to torture, or to deprive themselves of the industrious slaves, over whom they might exercise a lucrative oppression. The Jews still continued in Spain, under the weight of the civil and ecclesiastical laws, which in the same country have been faithfully transcribed in the code of the Inquisition. The Gothic kings and bishops at length discovered that injuries will produce hatred, and that hatred will find the opportunity of revenge. A nation, the secret or professed enemies of Christianity, still multiplied in servitude and distress, and the intrigues of the Jews promoted the rapid success of the Arabian conquerors. As soon as the barbarians withdrew their powerful support, the unpopular heresy of Arius sunk into contempt and oblivion. But the Greeks still retained their subtle and loquacious disposition, the establishment of an obscure doctrine suggested new questions, and new disputes, and it was always in the power of an ambitious prelate, or a fanatic monk, to violate the peace of the church, and, perhaps, of the empire. The historian of the empire may overlook these disputes, which were confined to the obscurity of schools and synods. The Manichaeans, who labored to reconcile the religions of Christ and Zoroaster, had secretly introduced themselves into the provinces, but these foreign sectaries were involved in the common disgrace of the Gnostics, and the imperial laws were executed by the public hatred. The rational opinions of the Pelagians were propagated from Britain to Rome, Africa, and Palestine, and silently expired in a superstitious age. But the East was distracted by the Nestorian and Eutychian controversies, which attempted to explain the mystery of the Incarnation, and hastened the ruin of Christianity in her native land. These controversies were first agitated under the reign of the younger Theodosius, but their important consequences extend far beyond the limits of the present volume. 
the metaphysical chain of argument, the contests of ecclesiastical ambition, and their political influence on the decline of the Byzantine Empire, may afford an interesting and instructive series of history, from the general councils of Ephesus and Chalcedon, to the conquest of the East by the successors of Mahomet. End of chapter 37, part 4thirty eight part one of the decline and fall of the roman empire volume three this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org chapter thirty eight reign and conversion of clovis his victories over the alemanni burgundians and visigoths establishment of the french monarchy in gaul laws of the barbarians State of the Romans, the Visigoths of Spain, Conquest of Britain by the Saxons. The Gauls, who impatiently supported the Roman yoke, received a memorable lesson from one of the lieutenants of Vespasian, whose weighty sense has been refined and expressed by the genius of Tacitus. The protection of the Republic has delivered Gaul from internal discord and foreign invasions, by the loss of national independence, you have acquired the name and privileges of Roman citizens. You enjoy, in common with ourselves, the permanent benefits of civil government, and your remote situation is less exposed to the accidental mischiefs of tyranny. Instead of exercising the rights of conquest, we have been contented to impose such tributes as are requisite for your own preservation. Peace cannot be secured without armies and armies must be supported at the expense of the people. It is for your sake, not for our own, that we guard the barrier of the Rhine against the ferocious Germans, who have so often attempted, and who will always desire, to exchange the solitude of their woods and morasses for the wealth and fertility of Gaul. The fall of Rome would be fatal to the provinces, and you would be buried in the ruins of that mighty fabric which has been raised by the valor and wisdom of eight hundred years, your imaginary freedom would be insulted and impressed by a savage master, and the expulsion of the Romans would be succeeded by the eternal hostilities of the barbarian conquerors. This salutary advice was accepted, and this strange prediction was accomplished. In the space of four hundred years, the hardy Gauls, who had encountered the arms of Caesar, were imperceptibly melted into the general mass of citizens and subjects. The Western Empire was dissolved and the Germans who had passed the Rhine fiercely contended for the possession of Gaul, and excited the contempt or abhorrence of its peaceful and polished inhabitants. With that conscious pride which the preeminence of knowledge and luxury seldom fails to inspire, they derided the hairy and gigantic savages of the north, their rustic manners, dissonant joy, voracious appetite, and their horrid appearance, equally disgusting to the sight and to the smell. The liberal studies were still cultivated in the schools of Autun and Bordeaux, and the language of Cicero and Virgil was familiar to the Gallic youth. Their ears were astonished by the harsh and unknown sounds of the Germanic dialect, and they ingeniously lamented that the trembling muses fled from the harmony of a Burgundian lyre. The Gauls were endowed with all the advantages of art and nature, but as they wanted courage to defend them, they were justly condemned to obey, and even to flatter, the victorious barbarians by whose clemency they held their precarious fortunes and their lives. As soon as Odoacer had extinguished the Western Empire, he sought the friendship of the most powerful of the barbarians. The new sovereign of Italy resigned to Yorick, king of the Visigoths, all the Roman conquests beyond the Alps, and as far as the Rhine and the ocean, and the Senate might confirm this liberal gift with some ostentation of power without any real loss of revenue or dominion. The lawful pretensions of Yurik were justified by ambition and success, and the Gothic nation might aspire under his command to the monarchy of Spain and Gaul. Arles and Marseille surrendered to his arms. He oppressed the freedom of Auvergne, and the bishop condescended to purchase his recall from exile by a tribute of just but reluctant praise. Sidonius waited before the gates of the palace among a crowd of ambassadors and suppliants, 
and their various business at the court of Bordeaux attested the power and the renown of the king of the Visigoths. The Heruli of the distant ocean, who painted their naked bodies with its cerulean color, implored his protection, and the Saxons respected the maritime provinces of a prince who was destitute of any naval force. The tall Burgundians submitted to his authority, nor did he restore the captive Franks till he had imposed on that fierce nation the terms of an unequal peace. The Vandals of Africa cultivated his useful friendship, and the Ostrogoths of Pannonia were supported by his powerful aid against the oppression of the neighboring Huns. The North, such are the lofty strains of the poet, was agitated or appeased by the nod of Uruk. The great king of Persia consulted the oracle of the West, and the aged god of the Tiber was protected by the swelling genius of the Garonne. The fortune of nations has often depended on accidents, and France may ascribe her greatness to the premature death of the Gothic king, at a time when his son Alaric was a helpless infant, and his adversary Clovis an ambitious and valiant youth. While Childeric, the father of Clovis, lived in exile in Germany, he was hospitably entertained by the queen as well as by the king of the Thuringians. After his restoration, Bafina escaped from her husband's bed to the arms of her lover, freely declaring that, if she had known a man wiser, stronger, or more beautiful than Childeric, that man should have been the object of her preference. Clovis was the offspring of this voluntary union, and when he was no more than fifteen years of age, he succeeded, by his father's death, to the command of the Salian tribe. The narrow limits of his kingdom were confined to the island of the Batavians, with the ancient diocese of Tournay and Arras, and the, at the baptism of Clovis the number of his warriors could not exceed five thousand. The kindred tribes of the Franks, who had seated themselves along the Belgic rivers, the Scheldt, the Meuse, the Moselle, and the Rhine, were governed by their independent kings of the Merovingian race, the equals, the allies, and sometimes the enemies of the Salic prince. But the Germans, who obeyed in peace the hereditary jurisdiction of their chiefs, was, were free to follow the standard of a popular and victorious general, and the superior merit of Clovis attracted the respect and allegiance of the national confederacy. When he first took the field, he had neither gold and silver in his coffers, nor wine and corn in his magazines. But he imitated the example of Caesar, who in the same country had acquired wealth by the sword, and purchased soldiers with the fruits of conquest. After each successful battle or expedition, the spoils were accumulated in one common mass. Every warrior received his proportionable share, and the royal prerogative submitted to the equal regulations of military law. The untamed spirit of the barbarians was taught to acknowledge the advantages of regular discipline. At the annual review of the month of March, their arms were diligently inspected, and when they traversed a peaceful territory, they were prohibited from touching a blade of grass. The justice of Clovis was inexorable, and his careless or disobedient soldiers were punished with instant death. It would be superfluous to praise the valor of a Frank, but the valor of Clovis was directed by cool and consummate prudence. In all his transactions with mankind, he calculated the weight of interest, of passion, and of opinion, and his manners were sometimes adapted to the sanguinary measures of the Germans, and sometimes moderated by the milder genius of Rome and Christianity. He was intercepted in the career of victory, since he died in the forty-fifth year of his age, but he had already accomplished, in a reign of thirty years, the establishment of the French monarchy in Gaul. The first exploit of Clovis was the defeat of Syagrius, the son of Aegidius, and the public quarrel might on this occasion be inflamed by private resentment. The glory of the father still insulted the Merovingian race. The power of the son might excite the jealous ambition of the king of the Franks. Syagrius inherited, as a patrimonial estate, the city and diocese of Soissons, the desolate remnant of the second Belgic, Reim and Troyes, Beauvais and Amiens, would naturally submit to the count or patrician, and after the dissolution of the Western Empire, he might reign with the title, or at least with the authority of King of the Romans. As a Roman, he had been educated in the liberal studies of rhetoric and jurisprudence, 
but he was engaged by accident and policy in the familiar use of the Germanic idiom. The independent barbarians resorted to the tribunal of a stranger who possessed the singular talent of explaining, in their native tongue, the dictates of reason and equity. The diligence and affability of their judge rendered him popular. The impartial wisdom of his decrees obtained their voluntary obedience and the reign of Siagrius over the Franks and Burgundians seemed to revive the original institution of civil society. In the midst of these peaceful occupations, Siagrius received, and boldly accepted, the hostile defiance of Clovis, who challenged his rival in the spirit, and almost in the language of chivalry, to appoint the day and the field of battle. In the time of Caesar, Soissons would have poured forth a body of fifty thousand horse, and such an army might have been plentifully supplied with shields, cuirasses, and military engines from the three arsenals or manufacturers of the city. But the courage and the numbers of the Gallic youth were long since exhausted, and the loose bands of volunteers or mer mercenaries who marched under the standard of Syagrius were incapable of contending with the national valor of the Franks. It would be ungenerous, without some more accurate knowledge of his strength and resources, to condemn the rapid flight of Syagrius who escaped, after the loss of a battle, to the distant court of Toulouse. The feeble minority of Alaric could not assist or protect an unfortunate fugitive. The pusillanimous Goths were intimidated by the menaces of Clovis, and the Roman king, after a short confinement, was delivered into the hands of the executioner. The Belgic cities surrendered to the king of the Franks, and his dominions were enlarged to the east by the ample diocese of Tongre, which Clovis subdued in the, in the tenth year of his reign. The name of the Alamanni has been absurdly derived from their imaginary settlements on the banks of the Laman Lake. That fortunate district, from the lake to Avench to, and Mount Jura, was occupied by the Burgundians. The northern parts of Helvetia had indeed been subdued by the ferocious Alamanni, who destroyed with their own hands the fruit of their conquest. A province, improved and adorned by the arts of Rome, was again reduced to a savage wilderness, and some vestige of the stately Vindenissa may still be discovered in the fertile and populous valley of the Arar. From the source of the Rhine to its conflux with the Main and the Moselle, the formidable swarms of the Alemanni commanded either side of the river by the right of ancient possession or recent victory. They spread themselves into Gaul over the modern provinces of Alsace and Lorraine, and their bold invasion of the kingdom of Cologne summoned the Salic prince to the defense of his Ripurian allies. Clovis encountered the invaders of Gaul in the plain of Tobiac, about twenty-four miles from Cologne, and the two fiercest nations of Germany were mutually animated by the memory of past exploits and the prospect of future greatness. The Franks, after an obstinate struggle, gave way, and the Alemanni, raising a shout of victory, impetuously pressed the retreat. But the battle was restored by the valor, the conduct, and perhaps by the piety of Clovis, and the event of the bloody day decided forever the alternative of empire or servitude. The last king of the Alemanni was slain in the field, and his people were slaughtered and pursued till they threw down their arms and yielded to the mercy of the conqueror. Without discipline, it was impossible for them to rally. They had contemptuously demolished the walls and fortifications which might have protected their distress and they were followed into the heart of their forests by an enemy not less active or intrepid than themselves. The great Theodoric congratulated the victory of Clovis, whose sister, Albofleda, the king of Italy, had lately married. But he mildly interceded with his brother in favor of the suppliants and fugitives who implored his protection. The Gallic territories, which were possessed by the Alemanni, became the prize of their conqueror, and the haughty nation, invincible or rebellious to the arms of Rome, acknowledged the sovereignty of the Merovingian kings, who graciously permitted them to enjoy their peculiar manners and institutions under the government of official and at length of hereditary dukes. After the conquest of the western provinces, the Franks alone maintained their ancient habitations beyond the Rhine. They gradually subdued and civilized the exhausted countries as far as the Elbe and the mountains of Bohemia, and the peace of Europe was secured by the obedience of Germany. Till the thirtieth year of his age, Clovis continued to worship the gods of his ancestors. 
his disbelief, or rather disregard of Christianity, might encourage him to pillage with less remorse the churches of an hostile territory. But his subjects of Gaul enjoyed the free exercise of religious worship, and the bishops entertained a more favorable hope of the idolater than of the heretics. The Merovingian prince had contracted a fortunate alliance with the fair Clotilda, the niece of the king of the Burgundy, who in the midst of an Arian court was educated in the profession of the Catholic faith. It was her interest, as well as her duty, to achieve the conversion of a pagan husband, and Clovis insensibly listened to the voice of love and religion. He consented, perhaps such terms had been previously stipulated, to the baptism of his eldest son, and though the sudden death of the infant excited some superstitious fears, he was persuaded a second time to repeat the dangerous experiment. In the distress of the Battle of Tolbiac, Clovis loudly invoked the god of Clotilda and of the Christians, and the victory disposed him to hear with respectful gratitude the eloquent Remigius, the bishop of Rheims, who forcefully displayed the temporal and spiritual advantages of his conversion. The king declared himself satisfied of the truth of the Catholic faith, and the political reasons which might have suspended his public professions were removed by the devout or loyal acclamations of the Franks who showed themselves alike prepared to follow their heroic leader to the field of battle or to the baptismal font. The important ceremony was performed in the, in the cathedral of Rheims with every circumstance of magnificence and solemnity which could impress an awful sense of religion on the minds of its rude proselytes. The new Constantine was immediately baptized with three thousand of his warlike subjects, and their example was imitated by the remainder of the gentle barbarians who, in obedience to the victorious prelate, adored the cross which they had burnt, and burnt the idols which they had formerly adored. The mind of Clovis was susceptible of transient fervor. He was exasperated by the pathetic tale of the passion and death of Christ, and instead of weighing the salutary consequences of that mysterious sacrifice, he exclaimed with indiscreet fury, Had I been present at the head of my valiant Franks, I would have revenged his injuries. But the savage conqueror of Gaul was incapable of examining the proofs of a religion which depends on the laborious investigation of historic evidence and speculative theology. He was still more incapable of feeling the mild influence of the gospel which persuades and purifies the heart of a genuine convert. His ambitious reign was a perpetual violation of moral and Christian duties. His hands were stained with blood in peace as well as in war. And, as soon as Clovis had di dismissed a synod of the Gallican Church, he calmly assassinated all the princes of the Merovingian race. Yet, the king of the Franks might sincerely worship the Christian god as a being more excellent and powerful than his national deities, and the signal deliverance and victory of Tolbiac encouraged Clovis to confide in the future protection of the Lord of Hosts. Martin, the most popular of the saints, had filled the western world with the fame of those miracles which were incessantly performed at his holy sepulchre of Tours. His visible or invisible aid promoted the cause of a liberal and orthodox prince, and the profane remark of Clovis himself, that St. Martin was an expensive friend, need not be interpreted as a symptom of any permanent or rational skepticism. But earth, as well as heaven, rejoiced in the conversion of the Franks. On the memorable day which Clovis ascended from the baptismal font, he alone in the Christian world deserved the name and prerogatives of a Catholic king. The emperor, Anastasius, entertained some dangerous errors concerning the nature of the divine incarnation. In the barbarians of Africa, Italy, Spain, and Gaul were involved in the Arian heresy. The eldest, or rather the only son of the church, was acknowledged by the clergy as their lawful sovereign, or glorious deliverer, and the arms of Clovis were strenuously supported by the zeal in favor of the Catholic faction. Under the Roman Empire, the wealth and jurisdiction of the bishops, their sacred character and perpetual office, their numerous dependents, popular eloquence, and provincial assemblies had rendered them always respectable and sometimes dangerous. Their influence was augmented with the progress of superstition and the establishment of the French monarchy may, in some degree, 
be ascribed to the firm alliance of a hundred prelates, who reigned in the discontented or independent cities of Gaul. The slight foundations of the Amorican Republic had been repeatedly shaken or overthrown, but the same people still guarded their domestic freedom, asserted the dignity of the Roman name, and bravely resisted the predatory inroads and regular attacks of Clovis, who labored to extend his conquests from the Seine to the Loire. Their successful opposition introduced an equal and honorable union. The Franks esteemed the valor of the Amoricans, and the Amoricans were reconciled by the religion of the Franks. The military force which had been stationed for the defense of Gaul consisted of 100 different bands of cavalry or infantry, and these troops, while they assumed the title and privileges of Roman soldiers, were renewed by an incessant supply of the barbarian youth. The extreme fortifications and scattered fragments of the empire were still defended by their hopeless courage, but their retreat was intercepted, and their communication was impracticable. They were abandoned by the Greek princes of Constantinople, and they piously disclaimed all connections with the Arian usurpers of Gaul. They accepted, without shame or reluctance, the generous capitulation which was proposed by a Catholic hero, and this spurious or legitimate progeny of the Roman legions were distinguished in the succeeding age by their arms, their ensigns, and their peculiar dress and institutions. But the national strength was in increased by these powerful and voluntary accessions, and the neighboring kingdoms dreaded the numbers as well as the spirit of the Franks. The reduction of the northern provinces of Gaul, instead of being decided by the chance of a single battle, appears to have been slowly effected by the gradual operation of war and treaty, and Clovis acquired each object of his ambition by such efforts or such concessions as were adequate to its real value. His savage character and the virtues of Henry the Fourth, suggests the most opposite ideas of human nature. Yet some resemblance may be found in the situation of two princes who conquered France by their valor, their policy, and the merits of a seasonable conversion. The kingdom of the Burgundians, which was defined by the course of two Gallic rivers, the Saint and the Rhone, ex extended from the forests of Vos to the Alps and the Sea of Marseilles. The scepter was in the hands of Gundobald. That valiant and ambitious prince had reduced the number of royal candidates by the death of two brothers, one of whom was the father of Clotilda. But his imperfect prudence still permitted Godesgil, the youngest of his brothers, to possess the dependent principality of Geneva. The Arian monarch was justly alarmed by the satisfaction and the hopes which seemed to animate his clergy and people after the conversion of Clovis and Gundobald convened at Lyon an assembly of his bishops to reconcile, if it were possible, the religious and political discontents. A vain conference was agitated between the two factions. The Arians upbraided the Catholics for the worship of three gods. The Catholics defended their cause by theological distinctions, and the usual arguments, objections, and replies were reverberated with obstinate clamor till the king revealed his secret apprehensions by an abrupt but decisive question, which he addressed to the orthodox bishops. If you truly profess the Christian religion, why do you not restrain the king of the Franks? He has declared war against me, and forms alliances with my enemies for my destruction. A sanguinary and covetous mind is not the symptom of a sincere conversion. Let him show his faith by his works. The answer of Avitus, bishop of Vienne, who spoke in the name of his brethren, was delivered with the voice and countenance of an angel. We are ignorant of the motives and intentions of the king of the Franks, but we are taught by scripture that the kingdoms which abandon the divine law are frequently subverted, and that the enemies will arise on every side against those who have made God their enemy. Return with thy people to the law of God, and he will give peace and security to thy dominions. The King of Burgundy, who was not prepared to accept the condition which the Catholics considered as essential to the treaty, delayed and dismissed the ecclesiastical conference, after reproaching his bishops that Clovis, their friend and proselyte, had privately attempted the allegiance of his brother. End of chapter 38, part 1
38, Part 2 of The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The allegiance of his brother was already seduced, and the obedience of Godsegil, who joined the royal standard with the troops of Geneva, more effectually promoted the success of the conspiracy. While the Franks and Burgundians contended with equal valor, his seasonable desertion decided the event of the battle, and as Gundebald was faintly supported by the disaffected Gauls, he yielded to the arms of Clovis, and hastily retreated from the field, which appears to have been situate between Langres and Dijon. He distrusted the strength of Dijon. A quadrangular fortress, encompassed by two rivers and a wall thirty feet high and fifteen thick, with four gates and thirty-three towers, he abandoned to the pursuit of Clovis the important cities of Lyon and Vienne, and Gundebald still fled with precipitation till he had reached Avignon, at the distance of two hundred and fifty miles from the field of battle. A long siege and an artful negotiation admonished the king of the Franks of the danger and difficulty of his enterprise. He imposed a tribute on the Burgundian prince, compelled him to pardon and reward his brother's treachery, and proudly returned to his own dominions with the spoils and captives of the southern provinces. This splendid triumph was soon clouded by the intelligence that Gundebald had violated his recent obligations, and that the unfortunate Godzegil, who was left at Vienne with a garrison of five thousand francs, had been besieged, surprised, and massacred by his inhuman brother. Such an outrage might have exasperated the patience of the most peaceful sovereign, yet the conqueror of Gaul dissembled the injury, released the tribute, and accepted the alliance and military servants of the king of Burgundy. Clovis no longer possessed those advantages which had assured the success of the preceding war, and his rival, instructed by adversity, had found new resources in the affections of his people. The Gauls, or Romans, applauded the mild and impartial laws of Gundobald, which almost raised them to the same level with their conquerors. The bishops were reconciled and flattered by the hopes which he artfully suggested of his approaching conversion, and though he alluded their accomplishment to the last moment of his life, his moderation secured the peace and suspended the ruin of the kingdom of Burgundy. I am impatient to pursue the final ruin of that kingdom, which was accomplished under the reign of Sigismund, the son of Gundobald. The Catholic Sigismund had acquired the honors of a saint and martyr but the hands of the royal saint were stained with the blood of his innocent son, whom he inhumanly sacrificed to the pride and resentment of a stepmother. He soon discovered his heir and bewailed the irreparable loss. While Sigismund embraced the corpse of the unfortunate youth, he received a severe admonition from one of his attendants. It is not his situation, O king. It is thine which deserves pity and lamentation. The reproaches of a guilty conscience were alleviated, however, by his liberal donations to the monastery of Agunum, or St. Maurice, in Valais, which he himself had founded in honor of the imaginary martyrs of the Thebian legion. A full chorus of perpetual psalmody was instituted by the pious king. He assiduously practiced the austere devotion of the monks, and it was his humble prayer that heaven would inflict in this world the punishment of his sins. His prayer was heard, the avengers were at hand, and the provinces of Burgundy were overwhelmed by an army of victorious Franks. After the event of an unsuccessful battle, Sigismund, who wished to protract his life that he might prolong his penance, concealed himself in the desert in a religious habit till he was discovered and betrayed by his subjects, who solicited the favor of their new masters. The captive monarch, with his wife and two children, were transported to Orléans, and buried alive in a deep well by the stern command of the sons of Clovis, whose cruelty might derive some excuse from the maxims and examples of the barbarous age. Their ambition, which urged them to achieve the conquest of Burgundy, was inflamed or disguised by filial piety, and Clotilda, whose sanctity did not consist in the forgiveness of injuries, pressed them to revenge her father's death on the family of his assassin. The rebellious Burgundians, for they had attempted to break their chains, were still permitted to enjoy their national laws under the obligations of tribute and military service. And the Merovingian princes peacefully reigned over a kingdom whose glory and greatness had first been overthrown by the arms of Clovis. The first victories of Clovis had insulted the honor of the Goths. 
they viewed his rapid progress with jealousy and terror, and the youthful fame of Alaric was oppressed by the more potent genius of his rival. Some disputes inevitably arose on the edge of their contiguous dominions, and after the delays of fruitless negotiation, a personal interview of the two kings was proposed and accepted. The conference of Clovis and Alaric was held in a small island of the Loire, near Amboise. They embraced, familiarly conversed, and feasted together, and separated with the warmest professions of peace and brotherly love. But their apparent confidence concealed a dark suspicion of hostile and treacherous designs, and their mutual complaints solicited, alluded, and disclaimed a final arbitration. At Paris, which he had already considered as his royal seat, Clovis declared to an assembly of the princes and warriors the pretense and the motive of a Gothic war. It grieves me to see that the Arians still possess the fairest portion of Gaul. Let us march against them with the aid of God, and having vanquished the heretics, we will possess and defy their fertile provinces. The Franks, who were inspired by hereditary valor and recent zeal, applauded the generous design of their monarch, expressed their resolution to conquer or die, since death and conquest would be equally profitable, and solemnly protested that they would never shave their beards till victory should absolve them from that inconvenient vow. The enterprise was promoted by the public or private exhortations of Clotilda. She reminded her husband how effectually some pious foundation would propitiate the deity and his servants and the Christian hero, darting his battle-axe with a skillful and nervous hand. There, said he, on that spot where my Francisca shall fall, will I erect a church in honor of the holy apostles. This ostentatious piety confirmed and justified the attachment of the Catholics, with whom he secretly corresponded, and their devout wishes were gradually ripened into a formidable conspiracy. The people of Aquitaine was alarmed, by the indiscreet reproaches of the Gothic tyrants, who justly accused them of preferring the dominion of the Franks. And their zealous adherent, Quintianus, bishop of Rodez, preached more forcibly in his exile than in his diocese. To resist these foreign and domestic enemies, who were fortified by the alliance of the Burgundians, Alaric collected his troops, far more numerous than the military powers of Clovis. The Visigoths resumed the exercise of arms, which they had neglected in a long and luxurious peace. A select band of valiant and robust slaves attended their masters to the field, and the cities of Gaul were compelled to furnish their doubtful and reluctant aid. Theodoric, king of the Ostrogoths, who reigned in Italy, had labored to maintain the tranquility of Gaul, and he assumed, or affected for that purpose, the impartial character of a mediator. But the sagacious monarch dreaded the rising empire of Clovis and he was firmly engaged to support the national and religious cause of the Goths. The accidental or artificial prodigies which adorned the expedition of Clovis were accepted by a superstitious age as the manifest declaration of the divine favor. He marched from Paris, and as he proceeded with decent reverence through the holy diocese of Tours, his anxiety tempted him to consult the shrine of St. Martin, the sanctuary and the oracle of Gaul. His messengers were instructed to remark the words of the psalm, which had happened to be chanted at the precise moment when they entered the church. Those words most fortunately expressed the valor and the victory of the champions of heaven, and the application was easily transferred to the new Joshua, the new Gideon, who went forth to battle against the enemies of the Lord. Orléans secured to the Franks a bridge on the Loire, but at the distance of forty miles from Poitiers, their progress was intercepted by an extraordinary swell of the river Vigena, or Vienne, and the opposite banks were covered by the encampment of the Visigoths. Delay must always be dangerous to barbarians, who consume the country through which they march, and had Clovis possessed leisure and materials, it might have been impracticable to construct a bridge or to force a passage in the face of a superior enemy. But the affectionate peasants, who were impatient to welcome the deliverer, could easily betray some unknown or unguarded ford. The merit of the discovery was enhanced by the useful interposition of fraud or fiction, and a white heart of singular size and beauty appeared to guide and animate the march of the Catholic army. The councils of the Visigoths were irresolute and distracted. A crowd of impatient warriors, presumptuous in their strength and disdaining to fly before the robbers of Germany, excited Alaric to assert in arms the name and blood of the conqueror of Rome. The advice of the graver chieftains pressed him to elude the first ardor of the Franks, and to expect, 
in the southern provinces of Gaul, the veteran and victorious Ostrogoths, whom the king of Italy had already sent to his assistance. The decisive moments were wasted in idle deliberation, and the Goths too hastily abandoned, perhaps, an advantageous post, and the opportunity of a secure retreat was lost by their slow and disorderly motions. After Clovis had passed the ford, as it is still named, of the heart, he advanced with bold and hasty steps to prevent the escape of the enemy. His nocturnal march was directed by a flaming meteor suspended in the air above the cathedral portier, and this signal, which might be previously concerted with the orthodox successor of St. Hilary, was compared to the column of fire that guided the Israelites in the desert. At the third hour of the day, about ten miles beyond Portier, Clovis overtook and instantly attacked the Gothic army, whose defeat was already prepared by terror and confusion. Yet they rallied in their extreme distress, and the martial youths, who had clamorously demanded the battle, refused to survive the ignominy of flight. The two kings encountered each other in single combat. Alaric fell by the hand of his rival, and the victorious Frank was saved by the goodness of his cuirass and the vigor of his horse from the spears of two desperate Goths, who furiously rode against him to revenge the death of their sovereign. The vague expression of a mountain of the slain serves to indicate a cruel though indefinite slaughter. But Gregory has carefully observed that his valiant countryman, Apollinarius, the son of Sidonius, lost his life at the head of the nobles of Avernia. Perhaps these suspected Catholics had been maliciously exposed to the blind assault of the enemy, and perhaps the influence of religion was superseded by personal attachment or military honor. Such is the empire of fortune, if we may still disguise our ignorance under that popular name, that it is almost equally difficult to foresee the events of war or to explain their various consequences. A bloody and complete victory has sometimes yielded no more than the possession of the field, and the loss of 10,000 men has sometimes been sufficient to destroy, in a single day, the work of ages. The decisive battle of Portier was followed by the conquest of Aquitaine. Alaric had left behind him an infant son, a bastard competitor, factious nobles, and a disloyal people, and the remaining forces of the Goths were oppressed by the general consternation, or opposed to each other in civil discord. The victorious king of the Franks proceeded without delay to the siege of Angoulême, at the sound of his trumpets, the walls of the city imitated the example of Jericho, and instantly fell to the ground, a splendid miracle, which may be reduced to the supposition that some clerical engineers had secretly undermined the foundations of the rampart. At Bordeaux, which submitted without resistance, Clovis established his winter quarters, and his prudent economy transported from Toulouse the royal treasuries, which were deposited in the capital of the monarchy. The conqueror penetrated as far as the confines of Spain, restored the honors of the Catholic Church, fixed in Aquitaine a colony of Franks, and delegated to his lieutenants the easy task of subduing or extirpating the nation of the Visigoths. But the Visigoths were protected by the wise and powerful monarch of Italy. While the balance was still equal, Theodoric had perhaps delayed the march of the Ostrogoths, but their strenuous efforts successfully resisted the ambition of Clovis, and the army of the Franks and their Burgundian allies was compelled to raise the siege of Arles, with the loss, as it was said, of thirty thousand men. These vicissitudes inclined the fierce spirit of Clovis to acquiesce in an advantageous treaty of peace. The Visigoths were suffered to retain the possession of Septimania, a narrow tract of seacoast from the Rhone to the Pyrenees. But the ample province of Aquitaine, from those mountains to the Loire, was irresolvably united to the kingdom of France. After the success of the Gothic War, Clovis accepted the honors of the Roman consulship. The emperor, Anastasius, ambitiously bestowed on the most powerful rival of Theodoric the titles and ensigns of that eminent dignity. Yet, from some unknown cause, the name of Clovis has not been inscribed in the Fasti, either in the east or west. On the solemn day, the monarch of Gaul, placing a diadem on his head, was invested in the church of St. Martin with a purple tunic and mantle. From thence he proceeded on horseback to the cathedral of Tours, and, as he passed through the streets, profusely scattered with his own hand a donative of gold and silver to the joyful multitude, who incessantly repeated their acclamations of Consul and Augustus. The legal or actual authority of Clovis could not receive any new accessions from the consular dignity. It was a name, a shadow, an empty pageant, 
and if the conqueror had been instructed to claim the ancient prerogatives of that high office, they must have expired with the period of its annual duration. But the Romans were disposed to revere, in the person of their master, that antique title which the emperors condescended to assume. The barbarian himself seemed to contract a sacred obligation to respect the majesty of the Republic, and the successors of Theodosius, by soliciting his friendship, tacitly forgave, and almost ratified, the usurpation of Gaul. Twenty-five years after the death of Clovis, this important concession was more formally declared in the treaty between his sons and the Emperor Justinian. The Ostrogoths of Italy, unable to defend their distant acquisitions, had resigned to the Franks the cities of Arles and Marseilles. Of Arles, still adorned with the seat of a Praetorian prefect, and of Marseilles, enriched by the advantages of trade and navigation. This transaction was confirmed by the imperial authority, and Justinian, generously yielding to the Franks the sovereignty of the countries beyond the Alps, which they already possessed, absolved the presentials from their allegiance, and established on a more lawful, though not more solid, foundation the throne of the Merovingians. After that era, they enjoyed the right of celebrating at Arles the games of the circus, and by a singular privilege, which was denied even to the Persian monarch, the gold coin impressed their name and image, obtained a legal currency in the empire. A Greek historian of that age has praised the private and public virtues of the Franks, with a partial enthusiasm with, that cannot be sufficiently justified by their domestic annals. He celebrates their politeness and urbanity, their regular government and orthodox religion, and boldly asserts that these barbarians could be distinguished only by their dress and language from the subjects of Rome. Perhaps the Franks already displayed the social disposition and lively graces, which, in every age, have disguised their vices, and sometimes concealed their intrinsic merit. Perhaps Agathius and the Greeks were dazzled by the rapid progress of their arms and the splendor of their empire. Since the conquest of Burgundy, Gaul, except the Gothic provinces of Septimania, was subject in its whole extent to the sons of Clovis. They had extinguished the German kingdom of Thuringia, and their vague dominion penetrated beyond the Rhine into the heart of their native forests. The Alemanni and Bavarians, who had occupied the Roman provinces of Raetia and Noricum to the south of the Danube, confessed themselves the humble vassals of the Franks, and the feeble barrier of the Alps was incapable of resisting their ambition. When the last survivor of the sons of Clovis united the inheritance and the conquests of the Merovingians, his kingdom extended far beyond the limits of modern France. Yet modern France such has been the progress of arts and policy, far surpasses in wealth and populousness and power the spacious yet savage realms of Clotaire or Dagobert. The Franks, or French, are the only people of Europe who can deduce a perpetual secession from the conquerors of the Western Empire, but their conquest of Gaul was followed by ten centuries of anarchy and ignorance. On the revival of learning, the students who had been formed in the schools of Athens and Rome disdained their barbarian ancestors, and a long period elapsed before the patient labor could provide the requisite materials to satisfy, or rather to excite, the curiosity of more enlightened times. At length, the eye of criticism and philosophy was directed to the antiquities of France, but even philosophers have been tainted by the contagion of prejudice and passion. The most extreme and exclusive systems of the personal servitude of the Gauls, or of their voluntary and equal alliance with the Franks, have been rashly conceived and obstinately defended, and the intemperate disputants have accused each other of conspiring against the prerogative of the crown, the dignity of the nobles, or the freedom of the people. Yet the sharp conflict has usefully exercised the adverse powers of learning and genius, and each antagonist, alternately vanquished and victorious, has extirpated some ancient errors, and established some interesting truths. An impartial stranger, instructed by their discoveries, their disputes, and even their faults, may describe, from the same original materials, the state of the Roman provincials, after Gaul had submitted to the arms and laws of the Merovingian kings. The rudest, or the most servile condition of human society, is regulated, however, by some fixed and general rules. When Tacitus surveyed the primitive simplicity of the Germans, he discovered some permanent maxims or customs of public and private life, which were preserved by faithful tradition till the introduction of the art of writing and of the Latin tongue. Before the election of the Merovingian kings, 
the most powerful tribe or nation of the Franks appointed four venerable chieftains to compose the Salic laws, and their labors were examined and approved in three successive assemblies of the people. After the baptism of Clovis, he reformed several articles that appeared incompatible with Christianity. The Salic law was again amended by his sons, and at length, under the reign of Dagobert, the code was revised and promulgated in its actual form, 120 years after the establishment of the French monarchy. Within the same period, the customs of the Ripurians were transcribed and published, and Charlemagne himself, the legislator of his age and country, had accurately studied the two national laws which still prevailed among the Franks. The same care was extended to their vassals, and the rude institutions of the Alemanni and Bavarians were diligently compiled and ratified by the supreme authority of the Merovingian kings. The Visigoths and Burgundians, whose conquests in Gaul preceded those of the Franks, showed less impatience to attain one of the principal benefits of civilized society. Yorick was the first of the Gothic princes who expressed in writing the manners and customs of his people, and the compositions of the Burgundian laws was a measure of policy rather than of justice, to alleviate the yoke and regain the affections of their Gallic subjects. Thus, by a singular coincidence, the Germans framed their artless institutions at a time when the elaborate system of Roman jurisprudence was finally consummated. In the Salic laws and the Pandex of Justinian, we may compare the first rudiments and the full maturity of civil wisdom. And whatever prejudices may be suggested in favor of barbarism, our calmer reflections will ascribe to the Romans the superior advantage not only of science and reason, but of humanity and justice. Yet the laws of the barbarians were adapted to their wants and desires, their occupations and their capacity, and they all contributed to preserve the peace and to promote the improvements of the society for whose use they were originally established. The Merovingians, instead of imposing a uniform rule of conduct on their various subjects, permitted each people and each family of their empire freely to enjoy their domestic institutions, nor were the Romans excluded from the common benefits of this legal toleration. The children embraced the law of their parents, the wife that of her husband, the freedman that of his patron, and in all causes where the parties were of different nations, the plaintiff or accuser was obliged to follow the tribunal of the defendant, who may always plead a judicial presumption of the right or innocence. A more ample latitude was allowed if every citizen, in the presence of the judge, might declare the law under which he desired to live, and the national society to which he chose to belong. Such an indulgence would abolish the partial distinctions of victory, and the Roman provincials might patiently acquiesce in the hardships of their condition, since it depended on themselves to assume the privilege, if they dared to assert the character, of free and warlike barbarians. End of chapter 38, part 2「of the Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. When justice inexorably requires the death of a murderer, each private citizen is fortified by the assurance that the laws, the magistrate, and the whole community are the guardians of his personal safety. But in the loose society of the Germans, revenge was always honorable, and often meritorious. The independent warrior chastised, or vindicated, with his own hand, the injuries which he had offered or received, and he had only to dread the resentment of the sons and kinsmen of the enemy whom he had sacrificed to his selfish or angry passions. The magistrate, conscious of his weakness, interposed, not to punish, but to reconcile, and he was satisfied if he could persuade or compel the contending parties to pay or to accept the moderate fine which had been ascertained as the price of blood. The fierce spirit of the Franks would have opposed a more rigorous sentence. The same fierceness despised these ineffectual restraints, and when their simple manners had been corrupted by the wealth of Gaul, the public peace was continuously violated by acts of hasty or deliberate guilt. In every just government the same penalty is inflicted, or at least is imposed, for the murder of a peasant or a prince. But the national inequality established by the Franks in their criminal proceedings was the last insult and abuse of conquest. 
in the calm moments of legislation, they solemnly pronounced that the life of a Roman was of smaller value than that of a barbarian. The Antrustian, a name expressive of the most illustrious birth or dignity among the Franks, was appreciated at the sum of six hundred pieces of gold, while the noble provincial, who was admitted to the king's table, might be legally murdered at the expense of three hundred pieces. Two hundred was deemed sufficient for a Frank of ordinary condition, but the meaner Romans were exposed to disgrace and danger by a trifling compensation of one hundred or even fifty pieces of gold. Had these laws been regulated by any principle of equity or reason, the public protection should have supplied, in just proportion, the want of personal strength. But the legislator had weighed in the scale, not of justice, but of policy, the loss of a soldier against that of a slave. The head of an insolent and rapacious barbarian was guarded by a heavy fine, and the slightest aid was afforded to the most defenseless subjects. Time insensibly abated the pride of the conquerors and the patience of the vanquished, and the boldest citizen was taught by experience that he might suffer more injuries than he could inflict. As the manners of the Franks became less ferocious, their laws were rendered more severe, and the Merovingian kings attempted to imitate the impartial rigor of the Visigoths and Burgundians. Under the empire of Charlemagne, murder was universally punished with death, and the use of capital punishments has been liberally multiplied in the jurisprudence of modern Europe. The civil and military professions, which had been separated by Constantine, were again united by the barbarians. The harsh sound of the Teutonic appellations were mollified into the Latin titles of duke, of count, or of prefect, and the same officer assumed, within his district, the command of the troops and the administration of justice. But the fierce and illiterate chieftain was seldom qualified to discharge the duties of a judge, which require all the faculties of a philosophic mind laboriously cultivated by experience and study, and his rude ignorance was compelled to embrace some simple and visible methods of ascertaining the cause of justice. In every religion, the deity has been invoked to confirm the truth or to punish the falsehood of human testimony, but this powerful instrument was misapplied and abused by the simplicity of the German legislators. The party accused might justify his innocence by producing before the tribunal a number of friendly witnesses who solemnly declared their belief or assurance that he was not guilty. According to the weight of the charge, this legal number of compurgators was multiplied. Seventy-two voices were required to absolve an incendiary or assassin. When the chastity of a queen of France was suspected, three hundred gallant nobles swore without hesitation that the infant prince had been actually begotten by her deceased husband. The sin and scandal of manifest and frequent perjuries engaged the magistrates to remove these dangerous temptations, and to supply the defects of human testimony by the famous experiments of fire and water. These extraordinary trials were so capriciously contrived that in some cases guilt, and the innocence in others, could not be proved without the interposition of a miracle. Such miracles were readily provided by fraud and credulity. The most intricate causes were determined by this easy and infallible method, and the turbulent barbarians, who might have disdained the sentence of a magistrate, submissively acquiesced in the judgment of God. But the trials of single combat gradually obtained superior credit and authority among a warlike people, who could not believe that a brave man deserved to suffer, or that a coward deserved to live. Both in civil and criminal proceedings, the plaintiff or accuser the defendant, or even the witness, were exposed to mortal challenge from the antagonist who was destitute of legal proofs, and it was incumbent on them either to desert their cause, or publicly to maintain their honor in the lists of battle. They fought, either on foot or on horseback, according to the custom of their nation, and the decision of the sword or lance was ratified by the sanction of heaven, of the judge, and of the people. This sanguinary law was introduced into Gaul by the Burgundians, and their legislator Gundobald condescended to answer the complaints and objections of his subject, Avitus. Is it not true, said the king of Burgundy to the bishop, that the event of national wars and private combats is directed by the judgment of God, and that his providence awards the victory to the juster cause? By such prevailing arguments, the absurd and cruel practice of judicial duels, which had been peculiar to some tribes of Germany, was propagated and established in all the monarchies of Europe, 
from Sicily to the Baltic. At the end of ten centuries, the reign of legal violence was not totally extinguished, and the ineffectual censures of saints, of popes, and of synods may seem to prove that the influence of superstition is weakened by its unnatural alliance with reason and humanity. The tribunals were stained with the blood, perhaps, of innocent and respectable citizens. The law, which now favors the rich, then yielded to the strong, and the old, the feeble, and the infirm were condemned either to renounce their fairest claims and possessions, to sustain the dangers of an unequal conflict, or to trust the doubtful aid of a mercenary champion. This oppressive jurisprudence was imposed on the provincials of Gaul, who complained of any injuries in their persons and property. Whatever might be the strength or courage of individuals, the victorious barbarians excelled in the love and exercise of arms, and the vanquished Roman was unjustly summoned to repeat in his own person the bloody contest which had already been decided against his country. A devouring host of 120,000 Germans had formerly passed the Rhine under the command of Ariovistus. One-third part of the fertile lands of the Sequani was appropriated to their use, and the conqueror soon repeated his oppressive demand of another third for the accommodation of a new colony of 24,000 barbarians, whom he had invited to share the rich harvest of Gaul. At the distance of 500 years, the Visigoths and Burgundians, who revenged the defeat of Ariovistus, usurped the same unequal proportion of two-thirds of the subject lands. But this distribution, instead of spreading over the province, may be reasonably confined to the peculiar districts where the victorious people had been planted by their own choice or the policy of their leader. In these districts, each barbarian was connected by the ties of hospitality with some Roman provincial. To this unwelcome guest, the proprietor was compelled to abandon two-thirds of his patrimony. But the German a shepherd and a hunter, might sometimes content himself with a spacious range of wood and pasture, and resign the smallest, though most valuable portion, to the toil of the industrious husbandman. The silence of ancient and authentic testimony has encouraged an opinion that the rapine of the Franks was not moderated or disguised by the forms of a legal division, that they dispersed themselves over the provinces of Gaul without order or control, and that each victorious robber, according to his wants, his avarice, and his strength, measured with his sword the extent of his new inheritance. At a distance from their sovereign, the barbarians might indeed be tempted to exercise such arbitrary depredation, but the firm and artful policy of Clovis must curb a licentious spirit, which would aggravate the misery of the vanquished, whilst it corrupted the union and discipline of the conquerors. The memorable vase of Soissons is a monument and a pledge of the regular distribution of the Gallic spoils. It was the duty and interest of Clovis to provide rewards for a successful army and settlements for a numerous people, without inflicting any wanton or superfluous injuries on the loyal Catholics of Gaul. The ample fund, which he might lawfully acquire of the imperial patrimony, vacant lands, and Gothic usurpations, would diminish the cruel necessity of seizure and confiscation, and the humble provincials, would more patiently acquiesce in the equal and regular distribution of their loss. The wealth of the Merovingian princes consisted in their extensive domain. After the conquest of Gaul, they still delighted in the rustic simplicity of their ancestors. The cities were abandoned to solitude and decay, and their coins, their charters, and their synods are still inscribed with the names of the villas or rural palaces in which they successfully resided. 160 of these palaces, a title which need not excite any unseasonable ideas of art or luxury, were scattered throughout the provinces of their kingdom, and if some might claim the honors of a fortress, the far greater part could be esteemed only in the light of profitable farms. The mansion of the long-haired kings was surrounded with convenient yards and stables for the cattle and the poultry. The garden was planted with useful vegetables. The various trades, the labors of agriculture, and even the arts of hunting and fishing were exercised by the servile hands for the emolument of the sovereign. His magazines were filled with corn and wine, either for sale or consumption, and the whole administration was conducted by the strictest maxims of private economy. This ample patrimony was appropriated to supply the hospitable plenty of Clovis and his successors, and to reward the fidelity of their brave companions, who, 
both in peace and war, were devoted to their personal service. Instead of a horse or suit of armor, each companion, according to his rank or merit or favor, was invested with a benefice, the primitive name and most simple form of the feudal possessions. These gifts might be resumed at the pleasure of the sovereign, and his feeble prerogative derived some support from the influence of his liberality. But this dependent tenure was gradually abolished by the independent and rapacious nobles of France, who established the perpetual property and hereditary succession of their benefices, a revolution salutary to the earth, which had been injured or neglected by its precarious masters. Besides these royal and beneficiary estates, a large proportion had been assigned in the division of Gaul of allodial and Salic lands. They were exempt from tribute, and the Salic lands were equally shared among the male descendants of the Franks. In the bloody discord and silent decay of the Merovingian line, a new order of tyrants arose in the provinces, who, under the appellation of seniors or lords, usurped a right to govern and a license to oppress the subjects of their peculiar territory. Their ambition might be checked by the hostile resistance of an equal, but the laws were extinguished, and the sacrilegious barbarians who dared to provoke the vengeance of a saint or bishop would seldom respect the landmarks of a profane and defenseless neighbor. The common or public right of nature, such as they had always been deemed by the Roman jurisprudence, were severely restrained by the German conquerors, whose amusement, or rather passion, was the exercise of hunting. The vague dominion which man has assumed over the wild inhabitants of the earth, the air, and the waters, was confined to some fortunate individuals of the human species. Gaul was again overspread with woods, and the animals, who were reserved for the use or pleasure of the Lord, might ravage with impunity the fields of his industrious vassals. The chase was the sacred privilege of the nobles and their domestic servants. Plebeian transgressors were legally chastised with stripes and imprisonment. But in an age which admitted a slight composition for the life of a citizen, it was a capital crime to destroy a stag or wild bull within the precincts of the royal forests. According to the maxims of ancient war, the conqueror became the lawful master of the enemy whom he had subdued and spared, and the fruitful cause of personal slavery, which had been almost suppressed by the peaceful sovereignty of Rome, was again revived and multiplied by the perpetual hostilities of the independent barbarians. The Goth, the Burgundian, or the Frank, who returned from a successful expedition, dragged after him a long train of sheep, of oxen, and of human captives, whom he treated with the same brutal contempt. The youths of an elegant form and ingenious aspect were set apart for the domestic service, a doubtful situation, which alternately exposed them to the favorable or cruel impulse of passion. The useful mechanics and servants, smiths, carpenters, tailors, shoemakers, cooks, gardeners, dyers, and workmen in gold and silver, etc., employed their skill for the use or profit of their master. But the Roman captives, who were destitute of art but capable of labor, were condemned, without regard to their former rank, to tend the cattle and cultivate the lands of the barbarians. The number of the hereditary bondsmen who were attached to the Gallic estates was continuously increased by new supplies, and the servile people, according to the situation and temper of their lords, was sometimes raised by precarious indulgence, and more frequently depressed by capricious despotism. An absolute power of life and death was exercised by these lords, and when they married their daughters, a train of useful servants, chained on the wagons to prevent their escape, was sent as a nuptial present into a distant country. The magistracy of the Roman laws protected the liberty of each citizen against the rash effects of his own distress or despair, but the subjects of the Merovingian kings might alienate their personal freedom, and this act of legal suicide, which was familiarly practiced, is expressed in terms most disgraceful and afflicting to the dignity of human nature. The example of the poor, who purchased life by the sacrifice of all that could render life desirable, was gradually imitated by the feeble and the devout, who, in times of public disorder, pusillanimously crowded to shelter themselves under the battlements of a powerful chief and around the shrine of a popular saint. Their submission was accepted by these temporal or spiritual patrons, 
and the hasty transaction irrevocably fix their own condition and that of their latest posterity. From the reign of Clovis, during five successive centuries, the laws and manners of Gaul uniformly tended to promote the increase and to confirm the duration of personal servitude. Time and violence had almost obliterated the intermediate ranks of society, and left an obscure and narrow interval between the noble and the slave. This arbitrary and recent division has been transformed by pride and prejudice into a national distinction, universally established by the arms and laws of the Merovingians. The nobles, who claim their genuine or fabulous descent from the independent and victorious Franks, have asserted and abused the indefeasible right of conquest over a prostrate crowd of slaves and plebeians, to whom they imputed the imaginary disgrace of a Gallic or Roman extraction. The general state and revolutions of France, a name which was imposed by the conquerors, may be illustrated by the particular example of a province, a diocese, or a senatorial family. Auvergne had formerly maintained a just preeminence among the independent states and cities of Gaul. The brave and numerous inhabitants displayed a singular trophy, the sword of Caesar himself, which he had lost when he was repulsed before the walls of Gergovia. As the common offspring of Troy, they claimed a fraternal alliance with the Romans, and if each province had imitated the courage and loyalty of Auvergne, the fall of the Western Empire might have been prevented or delayed. They firmly maintained the fidelity which they had reluctantly sworn to the Visigoths, but when their bravest nobles had fallen in the Battle of Poitiers, they accepted without resistance a victorious and Catholic sovereign. This easy and valuable conquest was achieved and possessed by Theodoric, the eldest son of Clovis. But the remote province was separated from his Austrasian dominions by the intermediate kingdoms of Soissons, Paris, and Orléans, which formed, after their father's death, the inheritance of his three brothers. The king of Paris, Childebert, was tempted by the neighborhood and beauty of Auvergne, the upper country, which rises towards the south into the mountains of the Cévennes, presented a rich and various prospect of woods and pastures. The sides of the hills were clothed with vines, and each eminence was crowned with a villa or castle. In the lower Auvergne, the river Aulie flows through the fair and spacious plain of Le Mangue, and the inexhaustible fertility of the soil supplied, and still supplies, without any interval of repose, the constant repetition of the same harvests. On the false report that their lawful sovereign had been slain in Germany, the city and diocese of Auvergne was betrayed by the grandson of Sidonius Apollinarius. Childebert enjoyed this clandestine victory, and the free subjects of Theodoric threatened to desert his standard if he indulged his private resentment while that nation was engaged in the Burgundian War. But the Franks of Austrasia soon yielded to the persuasive eloquence of their king. Follow me, said Theodoric, into Auvergne. I will lead you into a province where you will acquire gold, silver, slaves, cattle, and precious apparel to the full extent of your wishes. I repeat my promise. I give you the people and their wealth as your prey, and you may transport them at pleasure into your own country. By the execution of this promise, Theodoric justly forfeited the allegiance of a people whom he devoted to destruction. His troops, reinforced by the fiercest barbarians of Germany, spread desolation over the fruitful face of Auvergne, and two places only, a strong castle and a holy shrine, were saved or redeemed from their licentious fury. The castle of Moroliac was seated on a lofty rock which rose a hundred feet above the surface of the plain, and a large reservoir of fresh water was enclosed with some arable lands within the circle of its fortifications. The Franks beheld with envy and despair this impregnable fortress, but they surprised a party of fifty stragglers, and, as they were oppressed by the numbers of their captives, they fixed at a trifling ransom the alternative of life or death for these wretched victims whom the cruel barbarians were prepared to massacre on the refusal of the garrison. Another detachment penetrated as far as Brivas, or Briaud, where the inhabitants, with their valuable effects, had taken refuge in the sanctuary of St. Julian. The doors of this church resisted the assault, but a daring soldier entered through a window of the choir and opened a passage to his companions. The clergy and people, the sacred and the profane spoils, were rudely torn from the altar, 
and the sacrilegious division was made at a small distance from the town of Briaud. But this act of impiety was severely chastised by the devout son of Clovis. He punished with death the most atrocious offenders, left their secret accomplices to the vengeance of St. Julian, released the captives, restored the plunder, and extended the rites of sanctuary five miles around the sepulchre of the holy martyr. End of chapter 38, part 3